Um, so we have, so I'll talk to you, I'll talk first about the social issues. So there is a certain amount of airtime that is dedicated to social issues, but also what we try to do with a lot of our um, content that we create is really engage social issues in different, in different ways. And we've learned a lot from some of the models that have worked around the world, but really because these are real issues that are, um, that are, that we're dealing with. So some of our um, soaps or our telenovelas will deal with issues of um, violence against women or just general violence, and then there's a sort of a call to action and a support system that we try to put in place. Um, a support network that we try to connect with around the continent so that we are able to provide people with support. But some of the issues that we're also able to deal with are issues around um, organ donation and blood donation, which from a cultural perspective around the continent is something people don't really talk about. So we've actually been able to use a lot of our platforms to educate people. And really one of the things that, um, was, um, that happens that we've been able to see an uh, increase in actually how often people go out and donate blood is when we've had some tragedies on the continent, people have actually gone out and donated blood. And so a lot of this stigmatization has happened. Um, there's a lot of work that we do around destigmatization on HIV AIDS, um, destigmatization on, um, around any sort of um, disease or stuff like that. So those are a lot of the social work we do. But when it comes to advertising, it's the same advertisers that you would think of. So telecommunication companies, um, uh, who are um, Coca-Cola, you know, the fast-moving consumer good companies. So companies like Procter and Gamble, you know, Uber, Nestle, and local companies that are like the equivalent. So I'm giving you these names, but the local equivalents also advertise. So it is a, um, it is pretty global, the advertising uh, industry. Thank you. Yes, uh, what do you see as a shock? I know you have a campaign called Dark is Beautiful, and it's basically about India's obsession with fair skin. So I was wondering how that's going, and um, if you have any stories, any challenges that you've had about promoting that campaign? Yeah, so um, for those who don't know, in India and in other South Asian countries, and I think world over, one could happily or easily say, that there is an obsession with the fairness. I don't know what the history is with colonization, is it the European world that has kind of spread that, you know, being white is sort of the best, the supreme, it's a kind of casteism maybe of some sort, that um, even countries where the majority is dark skinned, sort of feels a sense of low esteem, feels we are not good enough being dark. And I think this deep prejudice or this deep complex has been cashed on by companies, by sort of um, product companies that uh, make these whitening creams. And there are now every single skin product that you find in the market, even like a face wash or even a vagina wash, which is really strange, has a whitening component. And well, whitening is not about whitening. There are all kinds of clean, clear, everything that's beautiful. And all the ads are about that you know you're you're dark, you're terrible, you're miserable, you're sad, and then you put this cream or whatever, and you're suddenly happy. And yeah, but the vagina cream, the ad is that the man's not looking at you. You're really sad. You go to the bathroom. You come out all sort of nice, and fresh, and ready for him. So the sad thing is the subtext is even more dangerous, that I'm not good enough, I cannot be successful, I cannot find the right lover, husband, whatever, as if that's the only goal of a woman, I cannot find a job if I'm not fair. We don't even call it pale, we call it fair-skinned. And if you see the matrimonial ads, and that's a good way of seeing have we at all changed, and probably things have become worse. From the time I was really young to now, I, every time I see a matrimonial ad, it always says fair and lovely. So again, I'm very fortunate to my parents that they didn't put this complex in me. But you cannot be dark and grow up in that country without 100 people telling you in different ways. So it would be some aunt who would say, don't go out in the sun, you'll become dark. Or, you know, don't play, don't swim, and put on this, or whatever. Or no one's going to marry you, and things like that. Um, I supported this campaign in last year, beginning of last year. It's called Dark is Beautiful. And I do support many other causes that I may not directly be involved in, but you, if you think it's a worthy cause, you at least sign a petition or you give two lines and do whatever little you can. But I didn't know that it would go so viral. I was amazed. I'm not, now I'm beginning to learn social media, thanks to all my friends here. But um, I, I was amazed how viral 
it went because it had touched a very, very raw nerve. And after that, the media got interested and I got tons of emails, especially from young girls. There were some who were almost on the verge of committing suicide because they were unable to be fair. So it's a, it's a huge obsession, and, but thankfully this campaign has brought in some kind of a, it's, it's given them a platform, it's kind of validated that you know, one doesn't have to be fair, that's not the only thing to latch on to. So um, there's actually been a tangible change as well. The advertising agency that monitors ads has banned four ads with very big Indian stars, so which was a great move. Uh, they've also made the guidelines much more strict for these kind of companies and the product sales of these whitening creams have actually gone down by 4%. That's some study that probably hopefully more than that. So I think it is, it is definitely a campaign that's gaining ground and it's sort of attracting more and more people and giving voice to them. In fact, I'm speaking about it tomorrow, kind of advertising, but you know, this is all at Yale and in New Haven. So yeah, tomorrow at 6 o'clock at Loose, I'm talking specifically about the Dark is Beautiful campaign. So if you're interested, come to For Viola, you mentioned the uh, the idea of what comes to mind in thinking about Africa in general, and you mentioned Ebola, and, and I can understand that because lately it's been in the press so much, but it made me think about it, and what I find comes to mind, maybe even more, or would have, is too many instances of Idi Amin's and Hutus and Tutsis and people that conscript the very young people into armies because they wish they would be Idi Amin. And, and I think that, that thought carries over to too many countries in Africa and, and, and paints the continent with a picture that's not a uh, a good one. And I wonder how you find that uh, thought. Uh, I'm sure this is not the first time that you've heard that. Um, I think um, just to sort of talk about that, um, the couple of things. Number one is that that is that is a reality, and those that was a reality of a time and place. But I think if you also look at some of the things that were happening during a lot of the um, those sort of dictator years in Africa, you would find that those were there were a lot of partnerships with the West actually that were actually mm -hmm. part of the problem and not the solution. So those are so that you know we could go into the historical validation and what, why and what happened when. But I think that um, if we only focus on that, we won't be able to see what's happening today, which is sort of the fact that there is a lot of places that is rule of law. There are, there are less wars now. I mean, a lot of the issues that we're having are really more global issues. So if you look at insurgency, which is a global issue, rather than a dictator. So because people are much more empowered, people are much more educated, prosperity on the continent, no one wants to sort of, no one's gonna sit by and watch while a dictator takes over today. And I think the challenge we have, and um, actually that's, I'm pretty confident that today there are no dictators that are gonna, that people are just gonna sit by and watch. Even if you look at a country like Zimbabwe and you look at the economic, uh, what's happening economically, there, are, there is a case, and I think there is a case of saying, okay, let's wait and see what happens here. But if people start to look at the economics of what's happening on the continent, I think there's much more positive stories and much more growth. And I think as long as you reinforce the Idi story, that's all people are gonna know. And I don't think that does anyone any justice. If young people are not educated about the world as a whole, and they're only educated about one tiny bit, and that's really more of what, my, my, what has pushed me and what has made me much more of a global citizen is the fact that I had a diversity of stories, and I was then able to make decisions. I was then able to overlay that with historical, in a historical context. And I think that's really more of my challenge with this type of story. But I think there are stories out there that we shouldn't forget, and that's part of what we try to do is make sure people tell those stories in the sense that they are the, the easier story when, I think a couple of years ago, Lincoln was one of the biggest um, films that was made in America, or was a award winning. And I think that that was something that globally everyone was like, oh, this is a great film. 
But if someone were to make a film about an African hero, like a hero president, everyone would be like, oh, that's not true, because the Idi Amin story is much more interesting, much more sellable, and much more attractive to people, and it reinforces what people already mm -hmm. think about Africa. And I think that's the danger of reinforcing those stories and only telling those stories. And so for me, what I try to do is help under, um, producers understand and independent creatives say, create your own Lincoln stories, and there's an African audience that wants to buy that story. And if Africans don't understand the context, they don't understand the story, they don't understand what Kwame Kuma did, if they don't understand what Kikwete is doing, if they don't understand the fact that it is a big deal that Madame Sirleaf is the, one of the first female presidents on the continent, if we're not educating 70-year-olds and 14-year-olds about that, they're never gonna have the type of confidence they need to actually lead our, our continent. And so that's really what pushes me to do what I do. Can I just add to this in the context of you know how we stereotype maybe even countries? I mean, India, we've gone through the same thing. India is a large country for 1.2 billion people. Uh, it's almost like a continent because the languages are so different and all of that. And we always struggle. Like when I travel outside, especially from earlier, they would say, oh, is, is there a lot of poverty? Do you, I mean, I've had an American ask me like about maybe seven, eight years ago, do you still have elephants on the road? Do you travel on elephants? And I had to literally say, we, we have parking issues, so now... <laughs> so, Four elephants. So, Four elephants. <laughs> now we are on horses, so... <laughs> so from that image of snake charmers and poverty and all of that, maybe Bollywood gives another image. That every, everybody's singing and dancing and living in fancy houses and dining in you know, New York and singing in Cape Town. So that's another image. So, but when Slumdog Millionaire came, why did the world love it and why did the Indians hate it? Because in some sense, it just kind of stereotypes. So I think it, it's just that we in our countries, whether it's India or Nigeria, like she also in her presentation said, we knew in Nigeria, you knew a lot about what was happening in the world, and especially America. But when we come here, people know so little about our countries. Whereas we get to know, I mean, because we have all, especially now with the globalized world, and so many channels, and we can watch CNN, and also Fox, and BBC, and whatever. So we get to know much more there. And I think the appeal is that it, these are complex countries. We just don't want to put it in any box. Everything is not right there, and one would never claim so. Everything is not all wrong. So it's just to be able to see a country or a place with all those contradictions and to kind of accept, which is true of this country too. Not everything is so amazing and not everything is so terrible. So it's, it's just... No, not, yeah, just to have a more sort of nuanced image of it.